Good afternoon everybody, lovely to be back with you. Uh, we are going to be talking today about the plagues of Egypt, as you said. Um, it's going to be quite a study-based talk, uh, so hopefully that's okay with you. Give me a shout if anything is going too fast, uh, if you want me to slow down. And if my wife falls asleep, it's because I've done this talk before, so <laughs> don't worry about that. Um, anyway, yes, this is our starting point on the screen. Uh, the Lord God said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land, unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. This is our starting verse, really, because God's seen the affliction of his people, and he's going to save them now. He's going to save the Israelites. It's going to be done through Moses who is described as a good son, a, a type of Christ, if you like, a son of heaven, a son of man. And what we're going to look at is sort of in depth of the account itself and see uh, that it's very structured and specific with a lot of detail, which God must want us to learn from. Uh, so the four things we're going to be looking at is some, some links with the plagues that maybe many of you have already seen already to elsewhere. Uh, we're going to look at the structure of the plagues themselves, We'll touch briefly on the, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart while, while we're there, because it's hard to uh, ignore that part of it. And then the purpose of the plagues for the people at the time, and, and for us now, really. So we're starting with, with the links for, of the plagues. The first one I've got on the screen, as I say, many of you may have seen this before. I have a verse from Exodus 12, verse 12, where God says that he will execute judgment on all the gods of Egypt. What this slide is, is showing is actually each of the plagues directly did execute judgment on each of the different gods of Egypt. So what I've listed there is the plagues itself, for example, the river turned to blood, and then a, a, an Egyptian god, if you like, that is sort of executed judgment upon. So you've got the rivers turning to blood was against the god Happy, the god of the spirit of the Nile. Or you've got uh, the lice that come up out of the dust, and you've got the, the god Seb, the god of the dust of the earth. One that might not be so easy to, to pick out um, is the, the boils one. So if you're a cast, you will we'll go to it later anyway. But when um, the plague of the boils comes, Moses takes some ashes out of the furnace and he throws them up to the heaven. So there you've got Nate, mother of the queen of highest heaven, when the ashes were thrown up towards the heavens there. Uh, so if you've not seen that before, that's quite interesting actually how... That verse in Exodus 12, verse 12, is very true. The, ex the judgments were executed very specifically against each of the gods of Egypt, and God was systematically sort of bringing the Egyptians down by taking on each of their, their deities individually, if you like. The next one uh, I'd like to move on to, if you want to open your Bibles to the account in Exodus, uh, it's this idea of, of uncreation. That's right. I explain what I mean. Uh, so we're in... Uh, Exodus 7, starting at. We're going to look through some of the, some of these plagues, and you can turn back to Genesis 1 as we go, if you like as well, and have your finger in both, if you prefer. But it's this idea of, of everything that God did in creation. He, he uncreates with the plagues, just as he sort of uncreated each of the Egyptian deities. So I've got them there on the screen. Day, day 1 of creation, God, God created light. And uh, we see in Exodus chapter 10 and verse 21 here Moses stretches his hand towards heaven and there's darkness over the land of Egypt it's a darkness interestingly that they can feel so it's not just about lack of light it's something quite different uh, something that they can they can feel and that's obviously in, in direct contradiction to, to day one uh, the creation of light as I've said day two God, God creates the, the waters uh, that we have the first plague, uh, the, the plague of the rivers to blood. That's in Exodus chapter 7. So we see in Exodus 7 and verse 19, the Lord spake to Moses, Say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and, thy, and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood. That word, pools of water, is the same word as the gatherings of water that you have in the creation account in Genesis 1. So he's very specifically undoing the, the waters that he gathered in, in the Genesis account. Day 3, we have the vegetation or, or the plants. Uh, there's a couple of these that I've listed. We'll start in, in Exodus 9 
Uh, this is the, the plague of, of hail. And what we see in Exodus 9, verse 22, uh, is that the Lord says to Moses, Stretch forth your hand toward heaven, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, upon man and beast, and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. Come forward to chapter 10. Uh, we've got the plague of the locusts. And in verse 15 there, it says, The locusts covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened, and they did eat every herb of the land, and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left, and there remained not any green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field through all the land of Egypt. So there's no green thing left. What God created on day three has been destroyed by these plagues. Day four, he creates the sun, the moon, and the stars. Um, we have the, the plague of darkness that we already looked at again, which um, is contravening that one. Day five, we have the sea creatures uh, and the birds. Now, for this, if we come back to Exodus chapter 8, first of all, uh, we're seeing here with the, with the frogs. So what we've got in verse 3, uh, and the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thy house and into thy bedchamber and upon thy bed and into the house of thy servants and upon thy people and into thine ovens and into thy kneading troughs. So what you have here is a creature that God created in water that's coming up out of the water into the places where man is living. And what we also see is in Genesis 1 verse 21, uh, God created great whales, every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas. So what we had there was a diversity of creatures within the seas, in the waters. Whereas here, you've got one creature that's come forth abundantly. There's no diversity anymore in contradiction to, to what happened on day five. Lastly, uh, the, the sixth day, God created the animals and mankind. Uh, there's a number of plagues there that, that we'll go through. So if you're still in chapter eight, we've got verse 17, the, the lice or the gnats. And Aaron stretched forth his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. So, interestingly, it's no longer mankind created from the dust of the earth. Now we've got a plague of lice coming against mankind. Verse 24, we have uh, the plague of the flies. And what we see here is that there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh, into his servants' houses, into all the land of Egypt, the land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies. I'm going to read you another verse from Genesis chapter 1, where it uh, says that God uh, says, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, that, uh, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that, creeping, that creepeth upon the earth. What we see is this is now reversed. It's not mankind that has dominion. This swarm of flies has dominion over mankind. And so we have that own creation there. In chapter 9 of Exodus, in verse 6, we have the pestilence. Uh, the Lord brings that pestilence, and on all the cattle of Egypt die. Uh, so again, against the, the creation of, of the cattle that God creates in, in day 6. You also have uh, the boils, maybe a bit more tenuous, but in verse 11, the magicians can't stand before Moses because of the boils, which was upon all the Egyptians. So you've got the boils brought against mankind, God's creation on day six. And lastly, of course, you have the death of the firstborn, directly killing uh, the firstborn son in each family and in direct contravention to God's creation of mankind on day six. So hopefully that makes a bit more sense now I've gone through it. So what you can see is it's not um, a random set of plagues. Now we've dug into it a bit more. It's not just a random series of God saying, oh, I'll do this next and this next. It's, it seems to be quite systematic uh, and, and ordered and, and very specific that it contravenes what he did in creation in Genesis chapter 1. There's a couple of other links as well. You've got uh, some mentions of seven days, for example, in chapter 7. And verse 25, that seven days were fulfilled where the, the river was turned to blood, just as there were seven days of creation. In uh, Genesis 1, if you go through an account, you've got God says seven times. And if you go through the Exodus account, you've got the Lord said 
uh, sorry, 10 times uh, in both cases. Uh, so there's, there's some other links that you can find, and I'm sure there's more. Uh, but this is very, very specific and not a random set of events. We're going to see this again now with, with our last link. And we're going to come, if you're turning your Bibles with me, to Revelation chapter 16. So we've gone backwards and looked back to creation itself, to, to the beginning, and seen the links with the plagues there. We're now going to see perhaps a repeating pattern of the end times in Revelation um, chapter 16. And here we have the vase of wrath that, that are poured out. And I, again, I've got the, the links on the screen so that we can see them. So in verse 2 of, of Revelation 16, the first went out and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon men which had the mark of the beast. Plague 6 of boils springs to mind. It then in verses 3 to 4, the second angel pours out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters and they became blood. So again, we're seeing uh, the, the, the waters, the gatherings, the pools, they're, they're turning to blood. And we see that here. Verse 10, the fifth angel pours out his vial and the kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. So notice again, just as we had a darkness that they could feel in the plagues, here this is a darkness which is causing them pain, so they can obviously feel this as well. It's not uh, a coincidental link here, it's very specific. Verse 13, we, we have the frogs that we've, we've looked at in the plagues. I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So not only are we linking to the plague of the frogs here, we see that they come out of the mouth of the dragon, like the, the serpent, like Aaron, um, the, the rod that was cast down and turned into a serpent. And also the frogs, they come up and they go into the kings of all the earth, just as the frogs in the plagues account, they come up and go into Pharaoh's bed chambers. Okay, there's very, very specific links here that we have. This next one may be um, a bit more tenuous, but we have the seventh angel in verse 17 uh, pouring out his vial, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. If you cast your mind back to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the firstborn, when he died, he said, It is finished, it is done. So that's how I link that there to the death of the firstborn. Lastly, uh, verse 21, you have I've got great hail falling out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And so we see the plague of the hail there. And I've not listed all of them out in this, from this chapter, so we've still got a few that I haven't found, but I'm pretty sure if you go elsewhere in, general, in uh, Revelation, you will find the ones that I've not listed here, listed in Revelation. I think the meaning is, uh, given to us in, in verse 11, really, uh, we see that the people at the time, whatever time this is speaking of, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Just as Pharaoh hardens his heart, so here the people are hardening their hearts and God is bringing these plagues. So perhaps this is a repeating pattern. Uh, maybe at uh, the times at the end before Jesus comes back, maybe these same plagues will be brought against the earth. We will have to wait and see. The question I asked myself was, will we be exposed to these plagues then ourselves if, if this is to happen? Because obviously it's quite scary what, what happened to us, uh, what happened in Exodus. Will we have to uh, suffer the same things? Coming we to, to Jeremiah, we, we start to see more of a picture of this as well. In Jeremiah chapter 4, we, we see a disaster from the north, the king of the north coming down to Israel. Again, if this is to be a repeating pattern, we have some verses in 23 to 28 that maybe God is going to be doing the same uncreation that he did with the plagues of Egypt, and again in the future with the earth because of man's hardness of heart. See in verse 23 that I beheld the earth, lo, it was without form and void, the heavens, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. 
I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. For thus of the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. So if this is to be a repeating pattern, we see a very similar thing described here in Jeremiah, with an uncreation, if you like, going back to an earth that is almost without form and void. But I think what I, what I take comfort from, if you come with me back to the Exodus accounts, if we come back to Exodus chapter 8, what we see is the first three plagues the, the Israelites are exposed to, if we are seeing ourselves as spiritual Israel now, if you like, if this is to be a repeating pattern, what will our exposure be? The Israelites were exposed at the start. I'll read you a verse from the third plague. I'm in verse 19. It says, Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the thing of, of God, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. So, sorry, I've read to you the wrong verse there, but what you've got is uh, in verse 17. It became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. So there's no mention of separation here. But at the end of this plague, in verse 19, the magicians then acknowledge that they can't replicate this plague. They say, this is the hand of God. And from that point forwards, uh, the children of Israel are, are separate from the plagues. So if you come forward to, to verse 22, uh, we've now got the fourth plague, the plague of the flies. And now God says, I will sever in that land the day of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. So... From all the plagues going forward after the magicians recognise God's hand, there is a separation and the, the children of Israel are kept away from these plagues and the things that happen, which surely is some comfort to us for future times. And this verse from Isaiah 26 sprung to mind for me, which is, Come, my people, enter thou into thy bedchambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as if it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. So I don't think it's all doom and gloom. I think there is some hope for us in what has happened, that we, we may not have to be exposed to all these things should they happen again, which, from my understanding, it, it seems likely that maybe God would, as he usually does, use these same patterns and, and repeat themselves. So that's the, the links that I wanted to go through with the plagues. Hopefully that's all made sense. We're going to go into the structure of the plagues now. Um, we're going to see that they have some different layers, and it, it's sort of similar to what I was saying with the links, that it's God systematically bringing Pharaoh to his knees and it, it's um, an order of destruction it's not a set of random events as we've already seen it's very specific God's, God's purpose is always uh, very specific and there's meaning in it so I'm going to go through this slide it might not make much sense yet uh, but we'll go through it together and then, and then hopefully you'll understand where I'm coming from so we've got sets of three in the plagues so what we're going to see is that in each of these cycles of three the first two plagues are warned, and the third is not. And also the first, so you've got in cycle one, plague A, in cycle two, plague A, in cycle three, plague A, they're, they're warned and they're in the morning. The second one is just warned, and the third one, there is no warning. So we'll, we'll go through the verses just to, to prove some of these. If you come to Exodus 17, I'm in verse 15, here we see the river to blood, the first plague, and you see that uh, God says to, uh, to Moses, get thee to Pharaoh in the morning. So here Moses is going to go unto Pharaoh, give him a warning in the morning that this plague is going to come. If you come forward to, to chapter 8 and verse 20, we now have, uh, bear with me one second. Yes. And the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning, stand before Pharaoh, lo, he cometh forth to the water. So this is the fourth plague, the plague of flies. We're in the second cycle. Um, and plague A. So again, the flies, they're warned, and it's in the morning. If you come forward to chapter 9 and verse 13, this is the seventh plague, the plague hail. We're now in cycle 3. And again, the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go. So we have a warning in the morning for all three of those plagues. 
If we now uh, we come back to Exodus chapter 8, we'll go through the, the second plague, the, the B plagues in each of these cycles. This is where, there's no mention of the morning, but there is still a warning given to Pharaoh. So verse 1, the Lord spake to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, and said the Lord God. We have it again in chapter 9, verse 1. This is the fifth plague. So plague B in cycle 2. Uh, and chapter 9, verse 1 says, the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, and he's to give him a warning. Lastly, chapter 10, verse 1, the eighth plague, the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh. And then... For plague C in each of these, bear with me one second, my Bible app has crashed. That's why I should use my paper Bible. Really. So we're in Exodus 8 and verse 16. So we're now on, on uh, plague C in each of the cycles. And you'll see in Exodus 8 verse 16, the third plague, the plague of gnats. The Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your rod and smite the dust of the land. There's no warning, uh, the, it, the plague is just incurred, it just happens. The same is true in chapter 9 and verse 8, where we have the sixth plague, the plague of boils. The Lord said to Moses and to Aaron, take handfuls of ashes, let Moses sprinkle it toward heaven. There's no warning that this will happen, this plague will happen if he doesn't uh, repent and let the people go. God just says, you're going to go and do it. And lastly, we have chapter 10 and verse 21. The ninth plague, plague of darkness. Again, Moses is just told to stretch out his hand toward the heaven that there's darkness. There's no warning given to Pharaoh. There's some other links as well, um, which I've written next to the cycles. You've got that the first three were all um, delivered, if you like, by Aaron. The second three were, were all delivered by God with no intervention needed from uh, Moses or Aaron. And the third three... Uh, are all delivered by Moses, such as the one that we've just seen in verse 21, that Moses is the one to stretch forth his hand. So you can chase through the verses and see that. So, again, what I'm trying to show to you, like I did with the links with the plagues, is this is not just random events happening here. There's a lot of links and detail and patterns. So much so that I've even got another slide, so I hope that you're still with me, because there's some more that we can do, and I'm sure there's more that other people will find. Because within, within each of these cycles, we, we find more patterns. So plagues one and two, uh, they both cause a stink, and they're able to be replicated by the magicians. And then the third plague of life, there's no stink or no replication. We can have a look at the verses just to, to prove this. In Exodus 7, verse 21, with the water turned to blood. The fish that were in the river died, the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water. But you also have in verse 22 that the, the magicians replicated this. In chapter 8 and verse 14, you have the same with uh, the frog. They gathered them together in heaps and the land stank. So we have this, this same stink coming. But if we come down to the third plague from verses 16 to 19, there's no stink mentioned. And as, as we've already said, the magicians then say this is the finger of God. In cycle two, with uh, the flies and the pestilence, we've got a, a division mentioned for Israel. And in the third one, we've not got a division mentioned. Now, I know I um, already said that I thought there was division for Israel for all of these. The reason I, I don't think there is for the boils is because uh, the Egyptian cattle has already been killed uh, in the pestilence plague. So what that suggests to me is maybe they've taken the Israelites' cattle uh, for themselves, which is why the division is not mentioned, because the Israelites have had their cattle taken from Egypt, so the pestilence falls on, on those cattle. Um, otherwise, when it describes the, the, pest, the, the wars coming on the Egyptians' cattle, they wouldn't have any cattle left because they've all been killed in the pestilence plague. Um, so that's maybe just a bit of an inference I'm making there. But again, we can look at the verses, if you're still in Exodus 8, verse 22, the fourth plague with the flies. Uh, it, we looked at this verse earlier about God severing in that day the land of Goshen. We see in chapter 9, and verse 6, with the, the uh, pestilence plague, uh, verse 6 says that not one of the cattle of the children of Israel died. Hence why I say that they must have stolen the cattle in my mind, because there was no cattle left for the Egyptians for the boils to fall upon at this point, if, unless they had, um, had stolen them. 
And then in, in the sixth plague with the boils, there's no division mentioned. The last one in, in cycle three, as you can see there on the screen, you've got confessions from Pharaoh in plague seven and eight, but no confession in the ninth plague. So if you come uh, to verse 27 of Exodus uh, chapter nine, hopefully you're still there. It says, uh, the Pharaoh sent a call to Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time, the Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. We again have it in chapter 10 and verse 16 with the plague of the locusts. This time Pharaoh calls for Moses and Aaron again, and he says, I've sinned against the Lord your God and against you. But if you go through the ninth plague, you, you will not find a confession that Pharaoh makes. So what I'm trying to show for these is God's judgment is ordered and constructive. It's not a set of random events. We've seen that from the links to elsewhere in scripture and to some of the Egyptian deities at the time. We've seen some of the, the cycles here and how these, these plagues are linked together. And it's not just a random set of events, certainly not in the way it's presented to us here in Exodus. I think we're being shown the intricacies of, of God's word and told to look into these things deeply and see how God actually works in the kingdoms of men. I mentioned this one earlier at the start, but another example of this is uh, where they, they take the ashes out of the furnace for the, the wars plague and it says that they sprinkled it up toward heaven and it became a boil breaking forth with blames upon man and upon beast. But what we also have here is a, a link to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 20, where it says, The Lord have taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as you are this day. So just as he says that he's um, bringing the people out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, we see Moses and Aaron enact that as they take the ashes out of the iron furnace and showing Pharaoh a literal picture that God will make sure his people leave Egypt. They will get away, and it, it's up to him to, to not harden his own heart. Which leads us on, nextly to the point I said we uh, discussed, because it's hard not to avoid this topic, really. It's not a controversial one, but maybe a difficult one for people sometimes to say, well, where was Pharaoh's free will, etc., etc. So I've done a, just a, a couple of moments on this that we can spend some time, that hopefully some things i found that might be helpful. Now, having gone through um, the, the accounts, what we actually see here is that Pharaoh hardens his heart seven times. And I've written those where it says, it says P. What you then have is this overlap period is in Exodus 9. Um, it's verses 12 and verses 34 to 35, where God hardens Pharaoh's heart, and then Pharaoh hardens his own heart twice again. And then after that, God hardens Pharaoh's heart seven times. There's two different words used for the hardening, and it's not like God uses one Pharaoh or another. So I'm, I don't know if anybody else has an answer for me on that. I'd love to hear if you do, but I'm not sure about the meaning of the word. Um, but what we see there, in, in my mind, is that Pharaoh still had the ability to harden his own heart after God had hardened his heart the first time. So Pharaoh hadn't lost his free will, as far as I can see. He was still choosing to harden his own heart. And it's almost as if... He, he gets to a point after that where God says, you've had your opportunity uh, and that's it. The metaphor I'd heard was it's like a canoe going towards a waterfall and you're trying to see how close you can get to the edge. And if you get too close, that will be it. You're down the waterfall and there's no getting away from it. And it's almost like um, God has said, you've had your opportunities, you keep hardening your heart. And as we know in Romans, he can make vessels to dishonour, and that's the point that Pharaoh gets to. But he clearly still had his free will, uh, because he was able to still harden his heart after God did. And I think what we see from, from Romans 9 as well, in the verse on the screen, is God then decides, I'm going to use you to illustrate my power throughout the earth. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So Pharaoh has his opportunities. He hardens his heart and God says, well, there's nothing more that can be done. I will now use you to declare my name throughout all the earth and save others and show them that they might know about me. He gives Pharaoh so many opportunities, as I've said, and we see it in, in verse um, 19 of Exodus chapter 10. Uh, and what, what he says there 
uh, this is the, the plague of the locusts. And what the Lord actually does is he turns a mighty strong west wind. It took away the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the coasts of Egypt. So it's almost a reminder for Pharaoh of what he had done of with drowning all the Hebrew sons. And he's also given a picture of what's to come if he doesn't repent. We know he eventually chases the, the people of Israel into the Red Sea and the Egyptians are all cast into the Red Sea and they're drowned. He's given a picture of it here with uh, the plague of locusts, the eighth plague here. And he, he, he still chooses not to listen. So that leads me on to, to the last section for us to look at, which is the purpose of these plagues. What can we learn from all the detail? What did the people at the time learn from the plagues? What can we learn from the hardening of the heart? Firstly, we see for the people at the time, initially there was uh, God, and we touched on it in Romans 9, it was to, to teach the Egyptians about God. And it says in Exodus 7, verses 4 to 5, Pharaoh will not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, and I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. So initially we see here it's um, a witness for the Egyptian people themselves at the time that God is declaring his name to them, the greatest nation at the time. But he's also using it to teach the Israelites. We see that in Exodus 14, again on the screen, where Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. So it was also a witness to them that they could see God's hand at work. And so should we. And to lead it on to, to us, I'm just going back to Exodus um, chapter 9, again the verses here on the screen. And we read in verse 1 that the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and tell him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Now, the word serve there is it's about being a slave to me. So God is saying, I want them to no longer be slaves to you. I want them to be slaves to me. And there's this idea of a change of masters from Pharaoh to our Lord God. Like baptism, that's, and that's what we're going to come on to. And we see that verse there of 1 Corinthians, that uh, the letter to Corinthians, it says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, passed through the sea, and were all baptised unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. If you turn me to Romans 6, this is where we're going to link it to us. Because we've, we've, we've seen a change of masters that God wants the children of Israel to have. They are no longer slaves to Egypt, slaves to Pharaoh, slaves to sin, if you like. They are to become slaves to God. And then when they pass through the Red Sea, we're told in the Corinthians that they were baptised as part of this changing of masters. Now in Romans 6, we, we have about, about our baptism, if you like. We see uh, in verse 4 that we are buried with Christ by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So this is talking about our baptism now, this, this passage if we have a look in verses 12 to 14, here we see that sin is to no longer reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And so we see as a result of this this baptism, what we must also do alongside this is have a change of masters, a change of masters from sin to God. And it's tied together in verse 22, where we're told that being made free from sin through baptism, we have become servants, or if you have a look at the Greek, the word is slaves, to God. So just as God says to, to Pharaoh, that let my people go so they become slaves to me, and they leave Egypt and are baptised and become slaves to him, so we, through baptism, change away from, from sin, from, from uh, metaphorical Egypt, if you like. And we also are told here we become slaves to God. So we have this, this same picture echoed for us, uh, which is kind of what I've been trying to show all the way through with God's patterns. And uh, it's so constructive and ordered. It's not a random set of events. It's meant for us to look into and understand for ourselves. 
And I think what we have acted out for us is with Pharaoh a, a picture of what sin is like, what the world is like, and the grip that it has on us, just as, as Pharaoh hardens his heart. And he tries, he tries to do everything that he can to, to keep uh, hold of the Jews, if you like. He, he sort of bargains. He, I suggest, feigns repentance. I'm not sure he ever really meant it when he did re repent. He flat out refuses to, to let them leave. And so in the end, they, they can't do a deal with Pharaoh. They just have to get up and they have to leave. And it's the same with sin, really, is, is what I think, that victory over sin is not easily won. It, the grip that it can have is very hard, and we can sometimes kid ourselves, but really we have to flee away from it, uh, just as the people of Israel did. I, I really like the example of Joseph with, with Potiphar's wife, when he just turns and he runs in the other direction. You just have it shown for us, the, uh, sort of acted out exactly what we should be doing metaphorically from our own sin and, and running away. And so we have no compromise that we can make with sin, just as there was no compromise that could be made with Pharaoh. We, we just have to turn the other way and have no part in it, just as we're commanded in Romans chapter 6. And God gives us lots of opportunities to do that in our lives. I think God, God is looking for us to, to repent, and we, we finished with that with the exhortation earlier, about the message of repentance for the kingdom. And we see in Deuteronomy 28 that if we don't soften our hearts, if we don't repent, the Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt and with the emeralds, with the scab and with the itch where I uh, can't be healed. And so our challenge is, is to listen to uh, the voice of the Lord in that chapter in verse 15. It says, if you will not hearken to the voice of the Lord, these things will happen. So we have to, to listen to our father and have a change of masters. And as the people of Israel do, to, uh, turn and flee from sin. So, just to sum up where we've, where we've looked at today, we've seen the links of the plagues to uh, the, the story of creation, we've seen the, the links to the future and things that, that may happen in the future, perhaps, I'm not saying dogmatically they will, but perhaps these things could happen again, and that's a warning to us not to harden our hearts, and for us to, to have this change of masters, to, to flee from sin, and, and turn to God and be servants to God, as we're told in Romans chapter 6. And we're told to look into these things through the immense detail of the account. And that just as God's judgment is uh, very detailed and constructive, we can see it now. We see it in the workings of the kingdom of men now. When we people questioned, um, why is Donald Trump in power? And I, you look at it yourself and wonder, how has that happened? And then the next year you see him declare Jerusalem the capital of Israel. And we go, well, that's why we know, because our Lord is working in the kingdoms of men. These things are not random incidents that are happening. This is, this is our God. He, he, he is constructive and detailed and everything has a purpose. Moses has to, to decide who he will be a servant to. We see in verse uh, 11 of chapter 3 on the screen that Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And we, we come from a transition where Moses has made his choice to serve God to uh, chapter 7, where the, the Lord God said to Moses, See, I've made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. So he was as a god to Pharaoh. That's what God had elevated him to. And uh, made me think, I suppose, that, um, well, first of all, he was that powerful that Pharaoh wouldn't kill him, uh, that God put him in that position, but also that, in our own lives, we may be the only God that people meet, if you like. And the way that we act uh, will, will resonate with people. And if we show the characteristics of God, that is how some people, it might be the only way that they truly see who God is. That is a challenge for us to do. And so I leave you with, with this verse on the slide here, that hopefully it be said of us that we have shown God's power and proclaimed his name throughout all the earth. Thank you. Yeah.